Here we are, Numbers Deuteronomy for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number nine in our 10 lesson series. And the um, title of this lesson is Detailed Laws for Living. We'll be covering uh, chapter 12 to 26. Hope that you've done your uh, reading uh, in order to take uh, the best advantage of this class. It's good if you've read ahead of uh, time. Uh, in our previous session, uh, Moses, in uh, preparation for the people to enter the promised land, reminded them of two basic things. First, the Ten Commandments and what's called the Shema, which is the instruction to love God above all else. And we'll read that in Deuteronomy uh, 6, beginning in verse uh, 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and uh, on your gates. And so this Shema uh, was the central affirmation of Judaism. And it was and is the expression of the belief in the singularity of God and uh, his incomparability. He was not compared to anything or anyone uh, in all of creation. Um, it is traditionally recited twice a day as part of the morning and evening uh, services. And so as uh, Moses moves into the next section of this book, he enumerates various ordinances which will serve as guides for worship, the exercise of justice and regular community life once the people are in the, um, in the promised uh, land. He will also elaborate on the blessings of obedience and the curses attached to disobedience. And you'll, you'll see that this this, this idea of uh, blessings attached to obedience and curses for disobedience is a theme that runs through a lot of the book of uh, Deuteronomy. In chapters 12 to 25, Moses will address 18 different topics. Now we don't have time to give detailed explanation of these, uh, but uh, I'll try to give you a brief description of each and uh, we'll select uh, just a few for more detailed study. I'll also include the passages in other books of the Bible where each of these ordinances were first given and then explained more thoroughly here in the book of Deuteronomy. We need to realize that Moses is not giving new instructions here, but he's reviewing and he's emphasizing laws and instructions that have already been given previously. So there are three main categories and there are 18 different ordinances or laws. And so we begin with the, uh, the first category, which is um, uh, worship and uh, religious practices. And the first item uh, that is spoken of in the category of worship and religious practices is the central sanctuary in Deuteronomy 12. The idea here is that worship and sacrifices must only be performed at the location that God himself has chosen centralized worship to maintain religious unity and to prevent idolatry. The purpose of centralizing worship in a specific God chosen location as dictated in Deuteronomy 12 had a profound religious, social and political implication for the, uh, for the Israelites. Uh, first of all, it uh, provided religious unity. Uh, by, by centralizing worship in one place, Moses aimed to create a unified religious practice among the Israelites. This would help maintain a cohesive belief system and also shared rituals, which are vital for preserving the cultural identity and the spiritual focus of the community. In a time when pagan worship often involved multiple shrines and multiple gods, the emphasis on a single worship site reinforced the uh, monotheistic foundation of the Israelite religion, emphasizing 
worship of the one true God, Yahweh, and worship in the one place that Yahweh had chosen. It also helped prevent idolatry. Idolatry was a significant threat to the spiritual fidelity of the Israelites, especially as they were about to enter a land populated by polytheistic uh, cultures. And so by, by centralizing worship, the law minimizes the risk of local influences and the proliferation of local shrines, which could easily incorporate idolatrous practices and beliefs. A central uh, sanctuary would also allow for better regulation and oversight of all the religious practices, ensuring that they remain pure and in accordance with God's uh, commands. And then of course, it also provided political and social uh, stability. Uh, a central place of worship served as a focal point for national gatherings, for festivals that brought people from all over the country to one place, uh, and also for judicial matters, there, thereby fostering you know, a sense of community and a sense of national unity. And so this centralization helped to solidify authority of the central government and the priesthood, stabilizing the society politically and socially. Remember, I keep going back to this all the time. The Jews for hundreds of years had been simply a slave nation, no government, no leadership, no military, no magistrates, no courts, nothing. And so they had to, you know, they had to, to build this from scratch. And so uh, having a centralized place of worship where the priests were and the judges were for political and, uh, uh, and uh, social matters uh, helped uh, create an organized uh, society. It also provided a venue where the entire nation could gather three times a year during major festivals, uh, like the Passover or uh, Pentecost or the Feast of Tabernacles. And having these festivals where everyone gathered together uh, promoted unity and it reaffirmed their collective covenant uh, with God. And then one more uh, reason um, uh, was the educational and uh, cultural uh, significance. The central sanctuary was not only a place for offering sacrifices, but also a venue for teaching and passing on the laws and traditions of Israel to succeeding generations. So, you know, families would go to, uh, to Jerusalem for uh, the Feast of Pentecost and they would bring their children and their children would hear the teaching. And as they grew up and married, they would bring successive generations. And so this was a way of uh, 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 teaching successive generations uh, the laws and the ordinances of God. So this setting allowed for a, you know, a consistent interpretation of the law, shared cultural practices, and the reinforcement of the historical narrative of the people of Israel. They would uh, tell over and over again the story of their release and freedom from Egypt, uh, their wanderings in the desert, and how God uh, redeemed them. In sum, the centralization of worship was a multifaceted strategy to ensure that the Israelites remained faithful to their covenant with God, fostering a strong unified uh, identity uh, that could withstand the influences and the challenges of the neighboring cultures. They were different, but they were the only ones. And so they had to have a strong identity among themselves. It was essential for maintaining the religious purity the social coherence, and also the political stability of this emerging Israelite society. And of course, you can go to Exodus 20, 24, 1 Kings 8, 29 as examples uh, and passages that talk about uh, how the centralized place of worship, the temple was built uh, and who built it and so on and so forth. Another topic uh, in this worship and religious practice section would be um, uh, prohibition against idolatry, Deuteronomy 12 and 13. Uh, this uh, prohibition forbade the worship of other gods and the use of idols. And the purpose of this was to ensure loyalty and purity in worship to Yahweh. And we can read about this in other places, Exodus 20, three to five, as well as Leviticus chapter 19. A third item under this category was the explanation of clean and unclean foods in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Again, 
these laws specified which animals, uh, which foods were permissible to eat. The uh, dietary laws in Deuteronomy 14, which define clean and unclean animals and detail what the Israelites may and may not eat, served several key purposes, both in setting the Israelites apart from other nations and potentially offering health benefits. Uh, um, the uh, dietary laws were a critical component of the Israelites' identity as God's chosen people. By adhering to a unique set of food rules, the Israelites visibly differentiated themselves from the neighboring cultures, many of which had no such uh, restrictions. This distinction was not just physical, but it was very symbolic, reinforcing their social covenant relationship with God. Why don't we do this? Because of our covenant uh, with God. Uh, eating an everyday activity became a regular reaffirmation of their spiritual and their cultural uh, identity. And there were also uh, health benefits. Uh, while the primary purpose of the dietary laws was to maintain ritual purity and obedience to God's commandments, modern interpreters often suggest that these laws might have had health benefits as well. For example, uh, avoiding pork and shellfish. Uh, these animals can care, we know now, can carry uh, parasites and diseases that are harmful to humans, particularly those who live in hot climates and in times when proper cooking techniques and preservation methods were uh, not well developed. And so avoiding these foods would have reduced the risk of foodborne uh, illnesses, which other nations uh, suffered from. Also avoiding dead animals and the eating of blood, prohibitions against uh, eating animals that were found dead and consuming blood likely reduce the risk of spreading diseases as these can be reservoirs, blood rather, can be reservoirs for various pathogens. And then of course the butchering and the food handling practices, you know, the rituals associated with the slaughtering and the handling of food likely ensured that meat was handled in a more hygienic way than might otherwise have been the case and as was the case with many of the um, uh, of the uh, pagan nations around them. And then there were social and uh, community uh, uh, aspects of this. The, the dietary laws uh, fostered a sense of community among the Israelites. You know, all of the Israelites uh, adhere to the same food laws. And so eating the same foods prepared in the same way uh, avoided divisions that might arise from different practices. These laws made it difficult for Israelites to eat meals with non-Israelites, thus preserving their religious and social integrity against outside influence. They were different and they were to be set apart and their eating laws helped to maintain that separateness, if you wish. And then finally, there were the moral and the theological implications of the food laws. These laws carried deeper symbolic meanings relating to holiness and purity. Uh, many of the animals deemed unclean were predators or scavengers, uh, which could symbolically represent death or uncleanness. And so the separation of meat and dairy, uh, for example, can be seen as a symbolic act of separating life, representing, uh, represented by milk, you know, the sustenance of the very young, uh, separating life from death. Uh, which was represented by meat. In conclusion, the dietary laws set forth in Deuteronomy served uh, multifaceted purposes. They reinforced the Israelites' distinct identity, potentially protected their health, it strengthened their community while upholding the theological and moral principles that was central uh, to their religion. These laws symbolized their separation from the impurities and the moral failings of the surrounding nations. And they underscored their dedication to a life of purity as commanded by God. Everything they did was done in a way that honored uh, God. And of course, uh, you can read about these food laws in the, in the book of Leviticus chapter 11, verses one to uh, 47. The next uh, item were uh, the tithes. Uh, 
the tithes, uh, of course we know the tithes, a tenth of all produce and livestock was to be given as a tithe uh, uh, to the uh, Levites. And then we know that the Levites themselves would take a tenth of what they had received and pass that along to the priests. And the purpose of this, of course, was to support the Levites and the temple uh, in its work, as well as assisting the poor. And uh, again, you can read about these laws in Numbers 18 and also in Leviticus uh, 27. Well, the next group of items uh, dealt with, let me get that up there, um, social justice and community regulations. So one of these items that dealt with social justice and community regulations was the sabbatical year, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Uh, sabbatical year uh, is when the debts were forgiven and Hebrew slaves were freed every seven years. Uh, the purpose of this uh, is that it promoted economic equality as well uh, as freedom. Uh, the bottom line was that the rich uh, couldn't get too rich and the poor would not be allowed to become too poor. You could be poor, but in Israel, you would not be destitute. You could be rich, but uh, not th that rich that you could be totally independent. Uh, uh, another item in this social justice and community regulations uh, area was uh, the law about firstborn animals in Deuteronomy 15. The firstborn of livestock was dedicated to God. Uh, and the purpose for this was to acknowledge God's provision and sovereignty. God is the one that gave everything to you that you had. And so therefore the firstborn of your livestock you would offer to God uh, in recognition of this uh, fact. Again, uh, references to the firstborn animals uh, in Exodus chapter 13. Next item uh, is uh, the pilgrimage festivals in Deuteronomy 16 in the area of uh, community regulations. Um, pilgrim festivals, um, these, uh, uh, these laws outline the requirements for celebrating Passover, uh, and Pentecost and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called booths. Uh, the purpose of these uh, was to strengthen national identity and community worship. National identity is a, is a sense of a nation as a cohesive whole represented by distinctive traditions, culture and language. And so in the context of religious or communal practices, these uh, feasts would play a significant role in strengthening the national identity and the national unity. Uh, Jews from all over the nation would come together for the same purpose, uh, three times uh, a year to celebrate uh, something they all uh, shared and believed in uh, as, a, uh, as a whole. Uh, they shared practices and rituals, uh, engaging in common rituals and customs uh, reinforced uh, their collective memory and shared history, making each individual uh, feel part of a larger society. You know, you were never alone. You shared a history with all the people of your nation. Uh, also cultural symbols, religious and communal symbols can serve as powerful markers of national identity. For instance, in the context of the Israelite culture, items like the menorah or the Ark of the Covenant, if you wish, were not just religious artifacts, but they were symbols of national pride and national identity. And then of course, uh, these festivals and these ordinances uh, uh, enabled the, the people to share a, a religious and moral framework uh, that unified a very diverse uh, population and it provided a common ground on which uh, society uh, and laws uh, could, be, uh, could be built. All the people shared the festivals for the same purpose and they all followed the same rules and the same laws. And, and the practice of this brought them together uh, as, a, as a nation. Um, also, um, these uh, festivals, these pilgrimage, uh, enhanced uh, community worship. Uh, worship involves uh, community members coming together to share in religious practices which reinforced social bonds and provided a sense of belonging. 
Uh, here's how communal worship uh, could be strengthened. Uh, first of all, uh, the practices were all inclusive. In other words, encouraging participation from all segments of society uh, could help to integrate the community more fully. Uh, men, uh, women, uh, the rich, the poor, the educated, the less educated, all of them uh, shared in the same festival and they shared in the same festival in the same way. So it was a way that everyone from every part of society could, could come together. Also, frequent and regular communal worship uh, kept the community tightly knit and it reinforced regular engagement uh, with uh, the uh, Israelites' uh, faith uh, and their practice of their faith. And also uh, national festivals and holidays uh, that included uh, community worship components, you know, such as the Passover or Pentecost tradition. These served not only religious functions, but also uh, celebrated uh, the Jewish uh, heritage uh, and it fostered a community spirit. In other words, like I said, men, women, rich, poor, educated, not educated, so on and so forth. You know, they all came together and they all shared equally in the, in the promises of God and in the hope uh, that, these, uh, uh, that these festivals uh, represented. And so these elements not only support the spiritual life of the community, but also its social structure and it enhanced both individual and collective well-being. In other words, it was good for everybody to come together regularly for worship. Uh, it was good for them then, and it's good for us today as Christians. It's good when brothers come together to worship on the first day of the week. Another item in this uh, category was the justice system in uh, Deuteronomy 16 verse 17. Here, uh, the justice system established judges and courts uh, mandating just rulings when there were uh, debates or uh, you know, issues of, of law. Uh, and it ensured justice and order within the community. You had a place uh, to go in order to resolve certain issue, monetary issue, uh, you know, real estate issues, whatever. There was a place you can go to get justice, to have the law interpreted for or against your, uh, your uh, position. Uh, the, next, um, the next item, yes, item number nine, was about the king's conduct. There actually were rules uh, even declaring that the king must act in a, a certain way. Uh, these set limits on the wealth and the power of a future king. They didn't even have a king at this point, and yet Moses provides them with a law that kind of restrained uh, the uh, power and the wealth uh, of a, a possible future king. Uh, this uh, set of rules prevented corruption and it promoted a focus on God's law rather than the amassing of wealth and power by the rich and the politically uh, powerful. The uh, tenth item, uh, were the rights of the Levites in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, Moses speaks about this. Uh, this provided physical and financial support for the Levites, instructions on how they were to be supported. Uh, uh, and the purpose of this was to ensure the welfare of the Levites and the priests, of course, so that they could continue to serve the community's spiritual needs. And you can read about this in Numbers uh, chapter 18. Again, I remind you in Deuteronomy, Moses is summarizing and repeating laws that have already been given. They're not new laws, they're laws that have already been given. And so when I say you can read about that in Numbers 18, uh, that's where this law was originally uh, introduced. Number 11, item number 11 um, was about the prophets in Deuteronomy 18. Here. The, Moses distinguishes between a true and a false uh, prophet. Uh, the idea was uh, if, a, if a prophet made a prophecy and it, didn't, and it wasn't fulfilled, uh, the, um, the, um, the consequence of that is that that prophet would be uh, executed. And of course, this provided a guidance to the community in following God's true messengers, not just any messenger, not just uh, a self-appointed messenger, but uh, it laid down a very strict uh, uh, rule about who 
uh, would be God's messengers. And those messengers would be the ones uh, who spoke the truth, uh, who uh, predicted that something would happen and it happened exactly as uh, they had said because their uh, message came uh, from God. And you can read more about this in 1 Kings chapter uh, 18 uh, that talks about um, uh, Elijah's uh, confrontation with the, uh, with the false prophets and what happened to those false prophets. Another uh, area uh, is that of uh, legal and ethical standards. So certain items about that. First item in this group is uh, uh, information about cities of refuge in Deuteronomy 19. Here, Moses establishes cities where those who commit manslaughter can uh, flee and find protection. Uh, the purpose of this, of course, was to provide a fair trial and uh, to prevent uh, just uh, blood vengeance. Uh, and uh, this idea about the cities of refuge uh, was first introduced in uh, Numbers 35, uh, 6 to 34. Uh, again, in this area, uh, item number 13, laws of warfare, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Uh, these laws set an ethical guideline for engaging in warfare. In other words, there were rules to follow even for the people of Israel, even when they were at war. The laws of warfare, as outlined in Deuteronomy 20, set forth several ethical guidelines for engaging in warfare that were notably progressive for that time. These guidelines reflect a deep concern for moral conduct in situations of conflict, emphasizing humane treatment of enemies and the preservation of resources. So here's a, a bit of an elaboration on these uh, uh, principles, just looking at the humane treatment of uh, enemies. For example, you had to offer peace before you made an assault. In Deuteronomy 20 verse 10, it stipulates that before attacking a city, an offer of peace must be made. If the city accepts the offer and opens its gates willingly, its people then are subjected to forced labor, but must not be killed. This provision promoted the preservation of life and provided a nonviolent option to resolve a conflict. You, you, they would either attack the city and kill everybody or offer you know, an alternative. We're stronger than you, we can come in and destroy you, but if you surrender, you know, you'll, be allowed to, uh, you'll be allowed to live. Also, there was protection for non-combatants. The laws provided that women and children and civilians generally should not be harmed during warfare. This uh, distinction between combatants and non-combatants underlined an early form of what we now consider the rules of engagement under international law, which uh, seeks to minimize uh, civilian uh, casualties. Now these rules were for uh, uh, normal times of war, which would come up uh, in a Jewish history and not necessarily uh, the command that they received uh, when they were to go in the promised land. The command there was to annihilate everybody, to remove everybody, not, nothing should, remains alive. They were to completely cleanse uh, the territory. These rules uh, were for the future once they were settled in and then had to protect themselves or at times when they would go to war with neighbors and so on and so forth. These were the rules that guided their contact. And then one more exemption from battle in 20, uh, Deuteronomy 25 to seven, exempts from battle those who have recently built a house or planted a vineyard or who were recently married or even fearful, thereby reducing trauma and ensuring that soldiers were mentally prepared and committed to the battle. And this consideration for personal and emotional states of individuals uh, uh, acknowledged the human aspect of warfare and aimed to maintain some kind of social stability, less PTSD, less trauma. You know, the soldiers who went into battle were prepared for battle. And then uh, if you want more references about this uh, outside of uh, Deuteronomy, you could go to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15. Item number 14 were just various laws. Uh, laws uh, on family and property and social behavior. These regulated personal and social conduct in order to maintain community harmony. 
uh, and they reflected what was previously taught in Leviticus uh, chapter 19. Item uh, 15 uh, was about marriage and family, Deuteronomy 22. Here there were regulation uh, for marital relations and uh, family responsibilities. The purpose was to preserve the family integrity and, and also ensured the protection of rights within the family. Again, you can read about this in Leviticus 18. Item uh, number uh, 16 uh, was about human dignity and rights, Deuteronomy 24 and five. Here, um, the information was about protecting the rights and the dignity of individuals, including the poor and those who were marginalized in society. The purpose of this was to promote fairness and compassion within the uh, community so that there was fairness and compassion for everyone in the community, not, not, not only the well-placed and the, and the well-meaning and the well-bred and the well-educated, but also for the poor and those who were ill and in, uh, infirmed. Uh, number 17 uh, was about loans and fair treatment, Deuteronomy 24. Here the ordinances in Deuteronomy 24 regarding loans and the fair treatment of the poor are a crucial component of the social justice system that was established through the Mosaic law. These laws emphasized ethical treatment in financial dealings and special considerations for the economically vulnerable members of society. So here's a little more explanation about these uh, rules. The purpose of these rules, well, first of all, there was a prohibition on interest on loans to fellow Israelites. In Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 13, uh, Moses instructs that if you lend anything to your fellow Israelite, you should not act as a creditor by demanding interest. This law discouraged exploitation of the financial, uh, financial hardships of others within your community, fostering a spirit of support and brotherhood. Your brother is falling on, uh, not just your brother and your family, your brother in the community is falling on hard times and needs help. If you offer help, then you're offering help. You're not offering a loan with interest. That was the, that was the point. Also, uh, the collateral rights of uh, debtors. Uh, the same chapter details how creditors should respect the dignity and basic needs of uh, debtors. It wasn't that you were never allowed to charge interest, you just weren't allowed to charge interest to your brother. Uh, some people uh, made loans, you know, specific loans uh, that they owed for. And so uh, a, a creditor must not enter, for example, a debtor's home to take a pledge, to take collateral, but must wait outside. And the garment that was taken as a pledge had to be returned by sunset so that the debtor could sleep in his cloak. Uh, this example uh, preserved the dignity and the well-being of the uh, debtor. It didn't erase the debtor's debt. That wasn't the point. The point was to treat the debtor uh, with uh, some dignity, uh, not entering his house and taking the collateral, but rather waiting outside, uh, pr pr you know, protected the sanctity of the person's home. Uh, not keeping, let's say it's his cloak, you know, uh, the example is for someone who's really poor, but if, if, uh, if he gave you his cloak as collateral for the debt, then you had to give it back to him at night so he could sleep uh, properly. In other words, you had to have a heart. Uh, uh, another um, another uh, issue, uh, another condition, if you wish, uh, was the remittance of death in the uh, sabbatical year. Although specifically elaborated in Deuteronomy 15, this aligns with the principles that are seen in Deuteronomy 24 that mandated that every creditor shall cancel the debts owed to him every seventh year. This prevents the accumulation of debt that could lead to poverty uh, and uh, enslavement. Again, you can read about this further in Leviticus chapter 25. 35 to 37. And then finally, number 18 uh, were rules on weights and measures in Deuteronomy 25. Of course, this uh, required honest weights and measures in uh, uh, trade negotiations. And the purpose of this, of course, was to promote fairness and trust 
in economic transition, uh, transactions, not only with your, you know, your kin, not only within Israel, but if you were having uh, transactions with other nations, uh, trading uh, you know, uh, wheat for sheep or whatever, uh, you would be known as someone who is honest in your uh, business uh, dealings. That was all part of being uh, God's, uh, God's people. So uh, these categories and explanations reveal how the ordinances in Deuteronomy are designed to ensure a just, ethical, and a devout community uh, that reflected God's covenant with Israel and of course their unique identity among the nations. They were different. Uh, all of these rules here uh, helped separate them from the uh, other nations. In uh, chapter 26, we get information about offering of the first fruits. Chapter 26 outlines a series of rituals and practices for the Israelites to follow upon entering the promised land, emphasizing gratitude, obedience, and the recognition of God's providence. So here's a, a brief outline and explanation of the material in this chapter. First, the offering of the first fruits, Deuteronomy 26, one to 11. So uh, upon entering the land and harvesting their first crops, the Israelites were to take the first of all the fruit of the ground, which they harvested from the land that God had given them and put it in a basket. They then went to the place chosen by God uh, for worship uh, and present that to the priest uh, who was in charge at that time. And so the worshiper would recite a brief history of Jacob's descent into Egypt, the affliction of the Israelites, their deliverance by God, and their arrival in the land flowing with milk and honey. And this recitation was a form of acknowledgement of God's help and uh, blessings. And so this offering symbolized the Israelites' gratitude for the land and their recognition of God's sovereignty and his generosity. And also it served as a reminder of their history and God's intervention in their lives. Then there was the matter of the tithe and the declaration, Deuteronomy 26, 12 to 15. Uh, here we read that every third year, which is the year of tithing, after storing all the tithes of produce uh, and so on and so forth, the Israelites are to declare that they have removed the sacred portion from their house and given it to the Levites, to the foreigners, to the orphans and widows, according to the commandment given by God. And so the worshiper was to recite a declaration in front of God, acknowledging that they had obeyed the commandments concerning the tithe, they hadn't forgotten them, and they hadn't consumed any in mourning or impurity or had given any of it for the dead. Uh, the purpose of this was to ensure the support, of course, of the Levites and the needy, fostering a spirit of community and shared responsibility. So the declaration acted as an affirmation of compliance with God's laws and a prayer for God to look down and bless his uh, people. And then finally, there was the uh, affirmation of the covenant in Deuteronomy uh, 16 to 19. Moses here instructs the Israelites to observe the statutes and judgments with all their heart, with all their soul. Uh, the chapter concludes with the Israelites affirming that they have avowed uh, the Lord to be their God and will walk in his ways and observe his laws. Of course, the purpose here was to reaffirm the covenant between God and the Israelites, emphasizing their commitment to follow God's commandments in return for his promise to set them high above all nations as a people holy unto himself. And so chapter 26 functions as a kind of a capstone to the legal instructions in Deuteronomy, emphasizing the importance of gratitude, obedience, and the remembrance of God's deliverance and blessings. Also, it, it served as a spiritual preparation for life in the promised land, reinforcing the community's relationship with God through rituals that reminded them of their collective history and of course, the divine mission uh, that they were on to be God's people, to be the light, if you wish, 
uh, in the world. And later on, as uh, God revealed to them, uh, they were to be the people that would bring forth uh, the, uh, the Messiah. So, uh, you know, a whole listing of laws, and I've given you reason for this law, reason for that law, but if we took it all together, there are perhaps uh, two uh, lessons that we can, uh, uh, that we can take uh, uh, for today's believer uh, from this information. Uh, the first of which is this, we need to centralize God in our lives. Too many times God is just over here, it's part of Sunday or part of our past. Yeah, I used to go to church when I was a kid or part of something we turn to when we're in trouble. You know, oh, we need to pray, somebody's sick, you know. Uh, that's not what the Jews were doing. That's not what God demanded of them. What God wanted was to be central in their lives. I think today we've forgotten that idea of centralizing God in our lives. We don't have as many rituals and ordinances as, as they have to, to remind us of this but we are still required uh, to do this. We have something better than rituals. We have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and uh, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Spirit within us. It should be easier for us uh, through the promptings of the Spirit within us to centralize God in our lives. As I said, in Deuteronomy, the Israelites were instructed to worship at a central sanctuary uh, and to eradicate all forms of idolatry, emphasizing the need to focus their spiritual and communal life around the one true God. This principle uh, could be translated into a contemporary setting as a call for Christians to pri prioritize their relationship with God above all else. You know, uh, the decisions that we make, we ask ourselves, well, how will that affect my family? And how will that affect you know, my salary? And how will that affect my health? You know? But uh, the first question we should ask is, how will this affect my relationship with God? Because that will affect everything else in our lives. And so this means avoiding modern idols, such as materialism and power or self, which can detract from a God-centered life. And it encourages believers to establish God as the central figure in all aspects of life, including decisions, relationships, as well as personal pursuits. So lesson one, centralize God in your life. Lesson number two, support and care for those who are in need. I mean, the numerous laws about fair treatment of the poor, widows, orphans, foreigners, even the environment in, in Deuteronomy uh, underscore our own responsibility towards those who are in need, starting with those in the church and then extending uh, to society uh, at large. They, the Jews as a nation, were meant to be a light unto the Gentiles. Isaiah 42 verse six. And we as individual disciples of Jesus Christ are meant to be the light of the world that we live in today. Matthew chapter five, verse 14. Different times, different people, same mission. We are to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be distinct uh, from the nations, if you wish, or from the people uh, around us. And the distinction that people see in us is there's light in our lives. There's light in our religious community, a light that they can see, a light that separates us from those who are in the darkness. All right, well, that's our lesson uh, for today. Give you your assignment here one more time. Uh, encourage you to go back and read Deuteronomy 12 uh, to 26, now that you have some of this background information, and then go ahead and finish up Deuteronomy chapters 27 to 34, and we will be doing our final lesson next time we meet. So thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.